Someone is reported missing. Many return to their families. For others, something has gone seriously wrong. A pregnant mum of three goes missing in Kent. There was no chance ever that girl was leaving those boys, ever. The police search was extensive. We all tried to think where she might go. It triggers a search of land and sea. There's water searches. We'll use underwater submersing vehicles. What happens in the police investigation that follows? Scientists managed to recover a smear of blood. What happens to the family at its heart? It was a really scary, tough time. When missing turns to murder. Debbie Griggs was my cousin. She was a really warm person, really warm, really caring, but she wouldn't think twice about the fun element. It would always be there. You could just laugh and giggle, do stupid stuff. Very easy to get along with and very approachable. And um, I don't think I've ever heard her have a crossword with anybody. She was a great mum, a great mum. Uh, I think she was put on this earth to be a mum, to be honest. Debbie was my mum's best friend, and she looked after me a lot when I was growing up. She picked me up from school, uh, my first school that I went to, almost every day, and me and her eldest son were joint at the hip, basically. We had a lot of kids' parties, and so when her children would have birthdays, we'd be around her house and we'd have parties in the garden. I just remember her always scooping me up for a cuddle. It was clear that everybody loved Debbie. People would go to her with their problems because she had a way about her that could just make things better. That might be physically making things better or just giving somebody a hug that made it feel better. 34-year-old Debbie Griggs trained as a nurse and worked in care homes until she has the first of three children. They're fathered by the man she married in 1990, Andrew Griggs. He's a local fisherman who sells his catch from his popular freezer store on the high street. It was in the busiest place in town. And nearly everybody used to use it, to be honest. And often go in for fresh fish and shellfish. And he was very often in there. Andrew Griggs was a very quiet man. And his family, they also lived in Deal as well. He was usually busy because he was either working in the shop or he was out fishing on his boat. Debbie and Andrew's relationship, it was pretty quick. It was very intense. Her mum and dad liked him, and they'd also met his parents, and his parents were respected in Deal. So it did seem that he was very suitable. I think the first I remember about Debbie and Andy was being surprised that they were engaged um, because I'd heard a few rumblings about Andy and they weren't pleasant because I knew a couple of friends who'd actually had dates with him and um, both friends had said um, they never got past one day because he was an angry individual. But Debbie falls for Andrew, and they marry. Everybody in the whole world has seen her wedding photos. She looked happy. You know, she looked ecstatic. You wearing that dress for a bit, then? You take it out of the table, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So when you... I've just always remembered her as just being a mother figure to me. She was just like a mum. Then she had the boys. The boys were 
lovely. You know, they were happy-go-lucky little boys. Postnatal depression, it was a problem for Debbie, but she was strategic. So when she experienced it, she went and saw a doctor, which helped her recover. Despite her ups and downs, Debbie becomes expectant again with baby number four. But the news isn't welcomed by her husband. In a sudden change of character, he claims that the unborn baby is not his, nor their previous child. But in reality, it is Andrew who has been embarking on an affair. Debbie became suspicious that Andrew was having an affair. She'd seen what she considered to be really inappropriate behavior with a young girl, and she asked him right out, are you sleeping with her? Now, he told her he wasn't, and that even though they were close friends, he wouldn't see her anymore. A distraught Debbie, expecting their fourth child, tries to put the affair behind them. Then she finds out that Andrew had started seeing the girl again. I don't think he was even trying that hard to hide it. And I don't know how long she would have put up with it without realising, you know, maybe the boys and I are better off without that kind of a role model. Because he was quite aggressive. If he thought that things were not going his way, he was a bully. Now in her third month of pregnancy, despite the increasing lies and turmoil, Debbie tries to keep her marriage and family life on track. She looked real down, as though um, nothing was going well for her. Debbie was doing all the typical mum stuff. She was taking her children to a birthday party, arranging to go to mother and toddlers the next day, and she was sorting times for that. That was on the 5th of May. I just remember my mum, she called me. She said, I've just had Auntie Pat on the phone. She said, I don't believe what I'm hearing. And mum was crying, actually. And she said, Debbie's disappeared. Debbie's family rang friends in London. They contacted everyone she knew. No one had seen her. She totally vanished. There was no chance ever that girl was leaving those boys, ever. If Debbie wanted to leave, those boys would be in the back of the car. But Debbie can't be traced. More worrying is that her important medication has been left behind. Debbie was an asthmatic. She'd left her inhaler behind. And the fact that she was pregnant, that made it even worse, because without her inhaler, her breathing would be really difficult. The family wants Debbie reported missing as a matter of urgency and press her husband to act. Debbie's family asked Andrew if he'd rang the police. He hadn't. Eventually, he does. Debbie Griggs' disappearance is logged by police. Good evening, please, South East Kent. How can I help? Yeah, I'd like to report a missing person. And how old is the missing person? She is 34 or 35. And how long has she been missing for? Uh, since uh, early this morning, late last night. Late last night? Yeah. I, I came home from work and, you know, got sort of lots of verbal abuse. Has there been any domestic problems? Yes. Given Debbie is pregnant, police class her as a vulnerable missing person. Finding her for her own welfare is a priority. You've got a mother with three young children who just, quite frankly, disappeared. So it's taken really seriously. A number of inquiries were conducted initially. Uh, and then such was the concern, it was then handed over to the major crime investigation team shortly afterwards. Four days pass. Debbie fails to contact anyone 
And there are no sightings of her. Debbie didn't take any clothes. She didn't take any of her jewellery. She didn't take anything with her. We all got in cars. We all tried to find her car. We all tried to think where she might go. I kept asking, where's Auntie Debbie? Where's Auntie Debbie? I miss her. And I was just told by my parents that she, Debbie's missing and we're looking for her. It was a really scary, tough time. I saw her. <laughs> Sorry. With many people involved in the search, Debbie's family car is found abandoned a few miles from home. The police go and get the car, they tow it away, and then they forensically examine it. But this discovery presents more questions than answers. They did find specks of blood in the boot of the car, and the carpet had been removed. Other than that, the car was forensically clean. There was no fingerprints, no jammy fingers, no crisp packets, no sign that the kids had ever even been in that car. Nothing. So where were all the fingerprints? Debbie had children. There should have been loads of mucky fingerprints all over the place, but nothing. I mean, why on earth would a young mum's car be forensically clean inside? Please search the fields behind in minute detail. There was lots of people looking for her. Her parents were always looking for her. Can police increase their search efforts? From a range of particular resources we can use, we'll use specialist search teams. If it's, uh, there's water searches, we'll use underwater submersible vehicles. We'll use divers if required, specialist search teams, dogs. I remember a lot of papers, uh, things on the news. There was even divers that had gone into the sea looking for her. Debbie's disappearance was understandably big news. It was in the newspapers, on local TV. So many appeals for information about Debbie, but no one knew where she was. Working with police and media, Debbie's mother herself makes a televised news appeal. And because her daughter is pregnant, Local maternity units are also notified. Now, Debbie had tricky pregnancies, especially towards the end where the baby was bigger and where her asthma was affected and became worse. It would be really difficult to have the baby without medical help. So all the hospitals were put on alert to look out for her. With days running into weeks, the continued appeals and word of mouth bring new witness statements to police. Now, the neighbour who lives directly across from Debbie's driveway, she gets up in the middle of the night to make herself a cup of tea, and she sees Debbie's car coming off the driveway and immediately thinks, that's strange, that's unusual. And also, because she was pregnant, she really hoped that everything was OK. The next day, she asks Andrew, and he says, She's left me. She's gone to stay with a friend. Questions start to be raised relating to Andrew Griggs's story. He dropped the boys off at Auntie Pat's with a changing bag for the little one. And in the bottom of the changing bag was Debbie's purse and her house and car keys. And bear in mind that the car was missing. How was it driven if the keys were in the bottom of that bag? Clearly, Debbie's family were absolutely confused by the facts here, with the car being found and with the blood in the boot. Andrew's explanation was that Debbie kept the buggy in there and she'd caught her finger when she was closing it up, and that was the reason for the blood. He was arrested pretty early on. I mean, you don't make arrests in a missing person case. The police were understandably suspicious straight away. 
because he was coming up with different stories. She left at 10 o'clock at night. She left at 11 o'clock at night. She left at 2 o'clock in the morning. He was changing things all the time. This intriguing turn of events confirms what some of Debbie's family have been suspecting, but can't prove. I think from the outset, when Debbie disappeared, her family and her friends knew the worst had happened, but they still had to find her. Everyone felt the same. No one believed that she left. From the very beginning, we knew he had done this. There was a collective thought about the kind of person that he was. Many people close to Debbie know of the issues and strain on the relationship she has with her husband. They share this and other concerns with detectives. Clearly, as we can imagine, family is a very emotional time for them. Uh, and everyone will have a view and everyone will have some information and some ideas of what might have happened. We will take any information from anybody and we'll assess that information and we'll make an assessment of the credibility of it. Will it get us to the answer of finding, uh, in this case, Debbie? Andrew was a very busy person. He was at the fishmongers working, he was on the boat fishing. He'd come home at night, read the children a bedtime story, put them to bed, then he'd go out. So Debbie was on her own a lot. And having not long suffered from postnatal depression, it clearly wasn't a great time. The family say that they did see at this point cracks begin to appear in their relationship. I think she wanted more input from her husband. She wanted him to be more of a family man. She wanted the kids to have that father figure, you know, that mother, father and kids all together thing. And no, I don't think she was happy at all. Now, Debbie distressingly knew that her husband was having an inappropriate relationship with a very young girl. When she confronted him about this, he promised her that he would stop, that he'd behave, that everything would be all right. But he didn't stop the relationship, and he continued to lie. In fact, he even took the girl to the fishing club, parading her in front of everyone there. And they were all asking, where's Debbie? To which he just replied, she's with the children. While Andrew Griggs is out showing off the young girl he's spending time with, a heartbroken Debbie turns to her close friends for help and comfort. I remember a time when Debbie came around the house and I could hear from the top of the stairs that she was quite upset. And I wanted to come down and see what was happening, but my mum asked me to go back upstairs, so it was quite clear what was wrong. After Debbie found out that her husband had had an affair with an underage girl, she was quite clearly round here, consoling in my mum about how she felt. I know she was pregnant, but I think possibly that was a last ditch attempt to keep the family together. So Debbie realised at this stage there was no stopping it. There was no saving the marriage anymore. So rightly, she told him to leave. With police now having a clear picture of Andrew Griggs's tempestuous life, they strongly suspect foul play. With no proof of Debbie's whereabouts, they still decide to approach the Crown Prosecution Service. Cold case murders are always very difficult. They're even more difficult um, when there's no body. For Debbie's family, they're now hoping there's enough evidence to start proceedings against Andrew Griggs. They are desperate to find her, and they are convinced he's responsible for her death. Somebody who didn't come forward at the time, but a little later, said that they saw his boat go past the end of Deal Pier at four in the morning. Andrew was always fishing. He was always busy out fishing. I didn't ever really see him much growing up because he was always out fishing. So he knew the sea like the back of his hand. So if there's anywhere that he would want to hide a body, he would choose the sea. I think he knows exactly where to hide a body. 
Before any case can be charged, we have to apply what's called the Code for Crown Prosecutors, which comprises two tests. The first is the evidential test, which means there has to be sufficient evidence to provide a realistic prospect of conviction. And once that test is met, we go on to consider the second test, which is called the public interest test. Both tests must be satisfied. At that point, my colleagues decided that there was insufficient evidence uh, to proceed to charge uh, any individual with offences in relation to her disappearance. We had lost hope. You just felt that as if life wasn't unjust enough by having this happen to Debbie. Now they're not even going to pursue it. Debbie's family must have been at their wit's end. How could they prove that he killed her? How could they get him locked away as he deserved? They must have felt powerless and totally unable to get the answers that they needed anywhere. The prime suspect, Andrew Griggs, is free to go. Not long after Debbie disappeared, Andrew sold his and Debbie's home and moved to Dorset with the boys. And it just made me angry and frustrated, especially finding out as an adult that he had lied to his children, because we still went to visit the children quite often and we would never talk about Debbie going missing or, or anything, because we loved them and we didn't want to bring it up. We just wanted to see the children and spend some time together, so we never spoke about it, really. Despite Griggs moving away, close friends continue to keep in contact so they can see Debbie's sons as they grow up. But that suddenly ended. There was no more phone calls or anything. It all just stopped. Imagine those poor boys, totally confused as to what had actually gone on and why their mother would just abandon them. Debbie's children have been lied to by Andrew Griggs their whole life. They have been told all sorts of things about Debbie. The worst one, her being insane, which is just not true. Um, he quite often would tell them things like she was a nasty mother, um, she was an angry mother, and I never remember her ever getting angry, ever. I was quite a dramatic child, and she would never get angry at me, she would never shout at me. She was always just lovely. With the family torn in two, those who stood by Debbie are left in limbo. One day, one hour, just rolled into the next and the next and the next, and it was suddenly that day that she disappeared was now a year, and another year, and another year, and another year, and then suddenly Uncle Brian was saying, we've got to put this to bed. We're going to have a memorial, and we had a memorial service for her in a church with a an order of service and everything. Debbie's body still hasn't been found. Her family and friends continue searching for the truth. Every time the Kent Police issued lists of missing people in Kent, we'd email them, where's Debbie? Why is she not on the list? And they would add her to the list uh, because they felt she was definitely murdered as opposed to missing. Family members set up a social media page called Debbie Elizabeth Griggs is Missing. They want to keep the story of her disappearance in the public eye. That didn't only post on anniversaries, that was kept all the time. It was constantly posted on, people invited to post memories about Debbie, any pictures, as well as any information they thought that they might have. Obviously, it was aimed at pressure on the police or the CPS. You know, any publicity in something like this is good publicity. But the passing of time doesn't mean Debbie's case is closed. All murder cases or serious crimes are kept under constant review by the police. And most forces have a cold case team, uh, which will periodically re review um, cases. 
This was one of those cases where the police continued to review it. To give Kent police their due, they never dropped it. It may not have been completely active all of the time. They knew the score. They knew who did it. A number of opportunities to uh, find Debbie's body were explored uh, right from 1999. There were a number of searches conducted in and around uh, Debbie's property at the time. They were actually reviewed uh, and revisited back in 2002, 2003, and in 2008 as well, using specialist uh, dogs and ground penetrating radar. But there are other techniques of solving cases. As part of the ongoing investigations the police carried out in the intervening period, they sought to establish what is often referred to as proof of life. And they were able to show that Debbie Griggs in the intervening period had not accessed any bank accounts, had not uh, registered with the Department of Work and Pensions. Uh, at the time she disappeared, uh, she was four and a half months pregnant. There was no record of her engaging with any medical services uh, or uh, any registration um, of her baby's birth. And that really led to the conclusion that by that stage, uh, she was dead. It's now official. Debbie Griggs is dead, not missing. The new murder investigation team pours through all the evidence that points to Andrew Griggs as her killer. Andrew Griggs was a master of deception. For example, he claimed that Debbie was suffering from depression. So uh, your main concern is her depression, I take? Yes, yeah, she is pregnant as well. Mm. She's been under the doctor for depression um, for a while. Any medication? Uh, she was on medication. We were able to discount that quite easily by going to her doctor, who told us no, she wasn't receiving any medication, and no, she wasn't suffering from depression. Debbie's car was recovered about a mile and a half away from the family home, in an area which Andrew knew quite well from his deliveries. When the car was examined, the boot lining and boot tray uh, were missing. Inquiries were made of the former owners of that vehicle who confirmed that when it was sold, the boot carpet and the boot lining were there. Further investigation by the forensic scientists managed to recover um, a smear of blood. It was found to be Debbie's. The logical conclusion to draw is that the reason the boot liner and boot tray were missing was because they were covered in Debbie's blood. And they were disposed of by Andrew. It was really a, a jigsaw puzzle, and that picture starts to build. So, for example, a neighbor who saw the car reversing off the drive at 2 a.m. on its own, of course, doesn't point to Andrew being the murderer. But that put together with the fact that the bank account was changed from joint names into his sole name, um, days before um, the murder. The fact that she went off and her car keys were, in fact, in the nappy bag elsewhere, that she went off without her bank cards. All of those little bits on their own are, are not enough to prove a case. But when you bring them all together and you bring in the lies that Andrew told, not just in interview, but to the friends and family, you get this picture. And in the end, having gone backwards and forwards to the police, asking for little extra bits of detail here and there, we were able to complete that jigsaw puzzle. Along with the fresh review, a handwritten note from the past is found by the new owners who bought Andrew Griggs's fish shop. We were very lucky to come across quite an important piece of evidence. When Andrew Griggs sold his business, um, a letter was found um, in the office. That letter was from the young girl, and it was extraordinarily explicit and implicit in what she wanted to do to him the next time they saw each other. It was from the underage girl Andrew Griggs, years before, had started an affair with, which he had utterly denied at the time. The letter was given to the police. 
there had been some doubt cast by Andrew as to whether, in fact, he had been having an affair, as alleged. But the letter was, for want of a better word, a love letter in quite explicit terms. And that letter proved that that affair had been going on uh, prior to the separation, throughout the separation, and, most importantly, at the time of the disappearance of his wife. They called in the girl, and they called in Andrew again. They asked the girl if she'd had a relationship with him, and she denied it. So the police showed her the letter, and then suddenly she just let it all go, and everything came out. The fact that she'd only been 13 when this started. He'd been lovely to her, he'd taken her out on his boat, bought her things, and eventually he'd manipulated her into a sexual relationship. He'd known exactly what he was doing. He was grooming her for sex. Andrew thought that he had got away with it. He'd moved down to Dorset. He'd established a new relationship. Now the father to six children. He never thought the police would come knocking on his door. And it's fair to say that he wasn't expecting them. I just remember my mum screaming on the phone. Oh, my God, they've, they've arrested him. They've arrested him. And, um... Just, at that stage, you've got to remember how many years on this was. You can imagine all the family are calling each other with the news they had wanted for years. Andrew's been arrested. Imagine, then, the surprise. It's now March 2019, and as opposed to it taking ages to get to court, it's all happening in October. It must have been an absolute whirlwind of emotions for the entire family. We had lost hope, because so many years had gone by that there was ever going to be a trial one day. And when we found out that he was arrested and there was going to be a trial, it just felt amazing, because we just knew this is it now, finally. It's an astounding 20 years after Debbie went missing, that the trial for her murder begins. Sadly, by this time, Debbie's mother has passed away. But for the rest of the family, they attend court to finally see Andrew Griggs in the dock. He appeared for what's called a, a pre-trial preparation hearing. And at that hearing, he entered his not guilty plea. Even surrounded by all of those people, Debbie's dad, her brothers, her friends, her son, and police and witnesses and so on. I attended a few days at the trial. They were shocking. I, there were things I didn't even know, things like the love letters. I didn't know anything about them. The atmosphere was, it was just very scary to to experience that and even see him again. He didn't really look at me. Um, he didn't look at anyone. During proceedings, more details about how Griggs treated his wife when she was alive are presented. Some of it includes written extracts from a diary she was encouraged to keep by her divorce lawyer. They read that he was following her. Andrew followed me to Helen's today. Andrew followed me to the shop. I went to the park where the children went to a birthday party. Debbie's family didn't know at the time, but she was obviously made to feel really controlled, really oppressed. She wasn't allowed to do the things that she wanted in the relationship. And he starts following her about to make absolutely certain that he knows exactly where she's going. They'd seen Debbie's affidavit that she wrote when she was getting the divorce, explaining why she wanted it. He said to one of his friends, I don't see why that bitch should get everything. 
Debbie was divorcing him because she found out he's playing away from home and won't stop. But as soon as the proceedings started, his solicitor says to him, you do know she's entitled to half the house, which she will probably get to keep because of the children, half the business, half the bank accounts, half of everything. Andrew then starts wooing her again. He starts taking around flowers, offering to put the children to bed, reading them stories, bathing them, basically doing things with the children so that finally Debbie can get a little bit of a break. And Debbie eventually caves in, says, let's give it another go because we've got the baby to consider and we've got the children to consider. It was very clear from what had been read out in court that he was as far away from being a good husband as anyone could imagine. He fully controlled the finances. He withheld money from Debbie and that's coercive control. And one of those incidents relating to money was dramatically captured by cameras in Griggs's fish shop. So Debbie goes around to the shop one day. This is when they'd split up and she's pregnant. She asks for some money for school shoes for one of the children. He says no. He said he hadn't got it. Says that she couldn't have it. So Debbie, understandably, opens one of the tills, goes to take the money out of it. Andrew was having none of it. She actually managed to get some coins, but the rest of the coins went all over the floor. Debbie ends up biting Andrew's arm because she's trying to get away from him, and he pushes her. And of course, she's pregnant, so she's trying to defend herself at the same time. Everyone in court is shown the video footage of Andrew Griggs then kneeing his pregnant wife in the stomach during the altercation. And I was watching how cold and how unemotional and detached he was from everything. And it, I just kept wondering how long he'd been like that, how Debbie had managed to live with him if that's how he'd been throughout their married life. The end of the court case came. They'd summed everything up. The jury now had to go away and come back with a verdict. Once the jury um, retire, there's always a sense of relief because you've done as much as you possibly can. There's no more evidence you can put before the jury. The job is done. You're now leaving your case in the hands of 12 men and women for their decision as to whether a person is guilty or not. Imagine the trauma for Debbie's family. The jury have retired. It all hangs on their decision. And then they're called back into court. jury finds Andrew Griggs guilty. I can only imagine how Debbie's family felt. Finally, a guilty verdict. When the judge came to pass sentence, he had read to him by the prosecution um, barrister um, a victim personal statement from Debbie's dad describing the devastating loss of their daughter and what was also the loss of the three grandchildren and the loss of a possible fourth grandchild and the fact that they had lived with not knowing and in fact still not knowing what happened to their daughter for, for 20 years. And that was a very moving statement because her father also referenced the fact that her mother Pat never got to know that Andrew Griggs had been charged with her daughter's murder. However, the judge was quite clear that, in his view, this was a premeditated murder, and that it was motivated by a desire to get out of the marriage, to bring that marriage to an end, 
and financial motivation in terms of gaining control of the business and not wanting to give Debbie anything. He had deceived the three sons, that he had brought up three young boys to believe their mother had disappeared. She'd been murdered, murdered by the very man that was bringing up her three sons. And the fact that this was a case where the body had never been um, recovered and its whereabouts um, are unknown. In reaching his sentencing decision, he took all of those factors into account and sentenced him to a period of 20 years in custody. And then given a life sentence, there was nothing. He wasn't angry, he wasn't sad, he wasn't remorseful. There was nothing. He had a wet fish shop. He, he went fishing and there he was, that cold, dead fish eye. That was him. But Debbie's murder is not the only crime that's discussed in court. So Andrew Griggs uh, wasn't prosecuted for underage sex um, when he was convicted. The, the issue being there is, uh, under the legislation that was available at the time, he had to be prosecuted within 12 months uh, of the commission of that offence. However, because the actual report or discovery of those offences came after 12 months, he wasn't uh, available to be prosecuted for those offences. And the judge actually made comment of that uh, particular issue uh, in their summing up in, he, in his ultimate conviction. I would want people to know that Greg's is pure evil in my eyes. He's an evil, selfish man. Debbie was lovely and an incredible mother, fun, just amazing to spend time with her, really. And I, I really wish that Everyone felt that way, especially the children. I wish they knew how much their mum loved them. Three years after Debbie disappeared, and three years after Griggs is convicted of her murder, there's unexpected news. We received information from Dorset Police recently, um, who received information, and acting on that information in relation to the murder of Debbie Griggs uh, back in 1999, her body was still outstanding. Uh, as a result of that information, we worked together with Dorset Police uh, and recovered uh, the body of Debbie Griggs from a garden uh, down in Dorset. It's a bit of a revelation for people to come to terms with the fact we have actually recovered her body and it wasn't out at sea. And it really puts some sort of closure on it for the family and it just gives them the opportunity to, to say their final goodbyes and knowing that Debbie can really rest in peace um, through all those years of uncertainty.